I learned about Claire Booth Luce when I was about your age, and I've always admired her, and maybe today I have learned. Oh, I did spell her name correctly. I was worried that maybe I had messed that up. In any case, I've been with the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons since I went into private practice, having escaped from the VA in 1980. It was founded in 1943. I am not quite that old. And our motto is omnio pro agroto, which means everything for the patient. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the cultural revolution that we are living through, and especially how it affects medicine, and some of the philosophy behind it, and maybe some things that we can do about it. This is one of the hot spots of the cultural revolution. It is the University of Arizona College of Medicine. At the time it was built, when I graduated from college, I did not go to medical school there, but I worked up there, whoops, in the biochemistry uh, research laboratory for a little while before I went off to the city, which as you all know is New York, New York. This is the statue of Hippocrates, which stood in a beautiful black marble reflecting pool, and you could not miss it if you approached the College of Medicine. We did not, uh, they did not smash that statue or paint it red, but they did move it or kind of hide it. And there he is standing in a little patio near the bookstore. And instead of the reflecting pool, there's a flower bed with a wasp nest in it. <laughs> uh, the Oath of Hippocrates is still on the pedestal in Greek. But it doesn't matter because nobody pays any attention to it. The students write their own oath. And they really don't even talk about what the Oath of Hippocrates says. It has been the traditional medical ethics for millennia. Hippocrates was in a minority at the time. The sect of Hippocrates had the radical idea that physicians were supposed to be healers, not killers. And the oath of Hippocrates specifically forbids abortion and euthanasia. It is rarely used in American medical schools today. They may, there may be things that are knockoffs that are called a Hippocratic Oath, but they do not have those, those provisions in it. Also, they leave out the part where, which, in which the physician promises that I will work for the good of my patients according to the best of my knowledge and judgment. And instead, it's substituted with things that really mean I'm going to do what the best practices the authorities tell me are, for the good of society. And you can barely see the College of Medicine anymore. This is the, um, the most expensive construction project in the state of Arizona. It's the University uh, Medical Center, Banner University. I recently was at a conference on health care reform sponsored by Banner, a big hospital a conglomerate that has eaten the University Medical Center. And they talked about health care reform. They had a beautiful picture in there of the three big pigs, two of which I think we can kind of agree with, is Big Pharma and maybe the American Association of Health Plans, and the other is sort of administration. But it left out a really, really big pig, which is Banner, and the other big parts of the hospital of managed care cartel, as well as the government. The new paradigm that they are trying to support in reform is population health, which is not the same thing as your health. Back when I was a resident, Donald Selden, who founded Texas Southwestern Department of Medicine, said what, uh, what medicine is about is about relieving pain, preventing disability, and postponing death. But now it's supposed to be about bringing us the new utopia. And we're going to have wonderful, wonderful things like editing the human genome, um, the, one, the speaker at this conference said he visualized reform as sort of like these controlled burns that he, vis that he witnessed when he was visiting in Mozambique. And I think what they're, going, they're trying to do is to burn down private medicine and traditional medical ethics. They stated that 34% is wasted of the $3.2 trillion that flows through the so-called healthcare system. I would submit that it's probably much worse than that, that before we get to the first unnecessary motorized wheelchair or the first unnecessary MRI scan, that at least 40% is bled off into shuffling money around and doing um, unnecessary counterproductive administration. They will talk that we need data. Oh, always more data. We need to know everything about you. 
um, except, of course, for honest price signals, without which we cannot have any type of rational economic system. And we're going to have value-based care, which means value of, of to the system, not the value of a procedure to you, the suffering individual. And they will always say, oh, we spend so much more than other nations on, on health care, and we don't get as good, good results. But the, the answer is, give us more money. And don't take a trillion dollars from Medicaid over the next 10 years. But of course, they, they don't let you know that this is the DC uh, type of terminology that we're going to reduce the rate of increase. And how can we take away $1 trillion that doesn't exist yet? We haven't printed it yet. We haven't taken it from the taxpayer yet. Or we haven't borrowed it from our creditors yet. But still, don't take it away from us. How are we going to pay for a $1.2 billion building if you take $122 billion out of Arizona Medicaid? That's supposed to be for you know, taking care of the, of the sick. A lot of these, these health care reform proposals, particularly single payer, the common modern terminology for socialized medicine, they, they're working what um, one of our members, Dr. Keith Smith, calls downstream from a bad assumption. That they're assuming that health care, uh, by which they don't really mean medical care, doesn't mean taking care of you, is the same thing as health insurance. And if you don't have coverage, you don't get care. The two are not the same. They also assume that comprehensive third-party payment is the same thing as insurance, which it absolutely is not, and it is really the cause for all of our financial problems, I think. Then they assume that the purpose of medicine is to serve something called equity in the world and to optimize population health. Keep in mind that if you're going to optimize population health, it doesn't help to keep alive a person who is going to be sick and, and disabled that that really detracts from your ultimate goal. Then we assume that health is a right and that rights are created by government. Dr. Smith, in an article in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons that that's, um, is referenced here, is a great admirer of Frederick Bastiat, as I am. He was a French economist about the time of the French Revolution who managed to squelch a lot of bad ideas by using the method of reductio ad absurdum, which means to carry an, a, an idea to its ridiculous extreme, whereupon people will see the, how ridiculous an idea is at the beginning. Some of Bastiat's famous examples included a thing about the candle makers. It's not fair for the sun to compete with the candle makers. Right? They lose business, so we have to keep people from, from, from opening their windows when the sun is out. They have always keep their blinds closed. And then the people were demanding more and more railroad depots as the railroad went through, which kept the companies from being able to make a profit. So Bastiat cleverly s suggested we should make the trains run backwards. And then there was the broken window fallacy. People were going to say, well, it's not so bad to have a window broken. After all, it creates jobs for people who get glaziers. People still think this way. I mean, there were people after Hurricane Harvey saying, well, it's not all bad. All these people lost their cars and their houses. Just think what that will do for the automobile industry and for the construction industry. And people are still having to say, well, now, wait a minute. Let's go back to Bastiat's broken window fallacy. Dr. Smith tried to say, well, with health equity, if we're going to have health equity, well, well why stop at the US borders? Why don't we go all around the world? He said, this didn't work because they thought, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And he said, well, maybe to make it seem ridiculous, I should have. I should have said, well, let's extend to extraterrestrials, too. The reduction ad absurdum just doesn't work so well these days, partly because we're living in a pretty absurd world, my opinion. I have to make a little digression here. I am a recovering uh, geometry teacher. How many, of you <laughs> how many of you took a course in formal geometry in high school? Great. Well, they still teach it some places. Um, I thought it was really great fun. My favorite method of proof was the, the proof by contradiction or the indirect method. If you want to prove A, let's assume not A and see where we end up. You demonstrate what logically has to follow from, a, from not A and show that it leads to a contradiction or to an absurdity. And therefore, not A is false and therefore A must be true. But today, a lot of us wonder sometimes, how can liberals hold two completely contradictory ideas in their head and yet their head does not explode. 
And I just think that perhaps we don't teach enough geometry or perhaps we, people segment things or f for whatever reason, we, we are learning to accept um, abnormal things as being normal. Maybe we live in an Alice in Wonderland world in which Alice said, sometimes I believe six impossible things before breakfast. Some of the impossible things that we seem to believe in and contradictory things, um, we say that homosexuality is inherited uh, which, from which it follows that it cannot be changed. Never mind, we can't find the gene. And that, and that, uh, that twin studies, identical twin studies, don't seem to go along with that. But if that is true, that it's genetic, it can't be changed. And therefore, we have to ban therapy for unwanted same-sex attractions. And in some states, you can lose your license if you as a therapist want to counsel an individual who says, I don't really like the way I am. Can you help me? change, you know, the therapist following the patient's own um, objectives, not subjecting him to electric shock or all kinds of horrible things, um, when we have to outlaw that. But on the other hand, sex, which is about as genetic as you can get, based on the chromosomes, is completely fluid. And so transition therapy should be required. And under the US Office of Civil Rights things, a doctor can be sanctioned if he does not for discrimination or sued for discrimination if he refuses to do some things that certain transgender activists want him to do. For example, if he prescribes hormones for menopause, he has to prescribe hormones to prevent puberty. And that they, they are, as acknowledged, they are sterilizing little boys at an age when the, when the child cannot possibly give informed consent for that. But we still hold these two, which seem to be completely contradictory ideas, at the same time. And they punish you if you don't believe them. Um, then we have the saying that men and women are the same. Well, if they are the same, then men should be, or at least men who think they're women, should be allowed to compete in women's sports. And women should have to serve in all combat roles. Well, the logical of the conclusion to this, the realistic real world conclusion is that um, women always lose and they get hurt. It's like forcing a lightweight to wrestle with a heavyweight. It's just really not fair. Uh, but it's assumed that, well, if you believe that, it must just be because you've been conditioned or just the social milieu that you live in tells you that. But the fact of the matter is that boys are stronger than girls, and they're not just a little bit stronger. I learned this when I was doing a construction project on my house. My brother-in-law would shovel mortar into this wheelbarrow. I could not lift it. And at the time, I was as strong as the average woman, or stronger. My nine-year-old nephew came along, picked it up, and ran down the hill with it as if it were nothing. He was a little guy. He was scrawny. Nine years old, he did that. Oh, wow. I knew that my father was stronger than I was. And should I feel that this is unfair? He had to use hot tar to marf, mop roofs in the hot sun in Arizona, from which he made money and sent me to medical school. And I should feel that I got a bad deal and that I should have to work the way he did? I don't think so. I mean, there are just certain facts of life that men have 40% more upper body strength. They have 25% greater lung capacity. They're filled with this hormone called testosterone that makes them very aggressive and driven. And we could give women more testosterone and subject them to very hard and rigorous physical training. But there's one thing we can't do anything about. Their feet are too small. And if you try to load 50 pounds of combat gear on a little foundation like that, it hurts. It damages women. It injures women. And they just really can't, can't do the same job as men. And I just don't think we, don't have to, we should not have to try. Then another thing that we have to believe in we have to believe in, we have to believe in evolution, we have to believe in natural selection, or else we will be considered anti-science. If you've seen ben, ben Stein's video, Expelled, you can't even be an academic astronomer if you don't profess a belief in Darwinian evolution, for which, of course, natural selection is a thing. Now, nobody's going to deny natural selection. You see it every day. The question is, what is it anyway? Here's this, this Harvard, Harvard uh, biologist who studies lizards and things like that. And he's saying, well, if we have natural selection, if it's strong, evolution occurs very, very quickly. 
and species have diversified to adapt to the different habitats that they find themselves in. And evolution occurs in response to selective agents. And what he's really saying is that if you have a habitat where a creature could be very successful, if only it had shorter legs and pads on its toes, so it could hold on to things, that it could thrive. And that natural selection stimulates. It's, it's like a creative thing. If you read their grammar, it almost sounds like natural selection is an intelligent designer or something. And how can that be? What natural selection really is, is death. And it's one of the things I learned in that upstairs lab in the medical school. I was working with some bacteria, E. coli, it, that some strains of which could make an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. That is an enzyme that, that enables the organism to use galactose, a fairly unusual sugar, as, a, as an energy source. If you take a bunch of E. coli and put it in a medium in which galactose is the only nutrient, the ones that can make that enzyme, they thrive, and all the others uh, die. And so it seems like this, uh, Jonathan Losos is suggesting that bacteria finding themselves in this environment, they're going to figure out how to make that enzyme if they don't already know. Well, you know what happens to them? They don't do anything. They don't have an energy source. They die. So natural selection, of course, occurs, but you have to realize what it is. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really serve as a creative force, but if you don't believe that it does create all of the variety of life, then you will be selected against in a very unnatural fashion, and you'll be kicked out of your job. And maybe not even allowed into medical school. So if some of you are thinking about applying to medical school, keep that in mind. I read a very interesting book recently by Tom Wolfe, who you may know as a novelist who has written a lot about the cultural changes that are occurring today. He wrote um, Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, A Man in Full, um, I Am Charlotte Simmons. But recently he wrote a very short and easy to read nonfiction book called The Kingdom of Speech, in which he really takes on Darwin on evolution and Noam Chomsky on linguistics. Makes these, these points about natural selection, that it can expand a creature's powers only to the point where it gives an advantage in competition. You don't get natural selection for something that's disadvantageous, that affects your ability to reproduce. So from, from this you could say, well, you know, how could natural selection give us homosexuality, which really works against your ability to produce offspring? Natural selection cannot produce any changes that are bad for a species. And it can't produce any specially developed organ that doesn't help the species at the present time, that only maybe will help it thousands of years into the future. And from this, Tom Wolfe, who is no creationist, I think he's probably agnostic, if not actually an atheist, concludes that mankind is impossible as a product of evolution because of two things, his skin and his speech organ. Mankind has been called the naked ape. All other mammals have, this, have fur. It makes them waterproof, it protects them against the elements, it protects them against cold. There is no conceivable advantage to not having fur. And if human beings had not learned how to use animal hides to protect themselves from the elements, the species never would have developed at all. And then there's the organ of speech which, which enables all these complex communications that we have. So, but nevertheless, despite leading to an impossible conclusion, we still have to believe in it. So there's another thing, a contradiction to, to this. So what is really going on here? About the end of World War II, there were three very famous novels written. Um, one is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. One is the, uh, 1984 by George Orwell, and you're probably familiar with those. And the third that's of the same type is That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis. It's the third in the Out of the Science out of the Silent Planet series, but you can read it on its own. And in it, they have a thing called Nice. Um, and some people think that some British WAG d adopted that for the British National Health Services health rationing scheme, in which they were trying to apply science to social problems and solve all of our world's, all of our world's uh, 
problems in the scientific way. And one of the things they did was they put the people into what's called the objective room, in which everything was just not right. The angles weren't square, it, the doorways weren't, weren't proper, everything was off center. And people had to, to learn to agree with this because they didn't just punish them, but they had remedial treatment which could go on and on and on. You could be re-educated re forever if you didn't agree with what was going on. And the hero of the story finally came to a conclusion that the normal, something called normal, actually existed. And he made his first real moral choice of standing up for what was normal and decided that if the so-called scientific view led away, led away from that, then be damned to the scientific point of view. Or as G.K. Chesterton's warned against, the modern and morbid habit that we have of always sacrificing the normal to the abnormal, forcing us to believe in things that are just contrary to human nature, you know, such as socialism. Anyway, that's liberalism in a nutshell, said G.K. Chesterton. So we have to go back to the first principles of what is really underlying all of this, all of this culture that we have. Um, there's a little poem that says, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and motion, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Anybody recognize that? It was from Hamlet by uh, William Shakespeare, whoever he was, but we do know he was a dead white European male. <laughs> And he's been translated into nine, more than 90 languages, performed thousands of times throughout the world. And this is part of our culture that we're trying to obliterate. Or there's the principle that we're supposed to believe in these days, that mankind just evolved by chance from pond scum. If things had gone a little differently, then we'd have a different species here instead of us. And that we have to believe in natural selection as the organizing principle of biology. And remember, natural selection is death. Well, the consequences of this mode of thinking, I mean, you've probably heard that if God is, get, is dead, everything is permitted. It could be taken even farther than that, as in Dostoevsky's novel by one of the brothers Karamazov, Karamazov that uh, actually, if um, God is dead, evil doing should not only be permitted, but be the best way to be, the most necessary and intelligent solution for people. Um, the Brothers Karamazov, I strongly urge you to read it. The last novel that Dostoevsky wrote, it was set in late 19th century Russia when socialism was kind of in the, in the air being talked about, although it was before the Bolshevik Revolution, and brings up all kinds of great questions of faith and doubt. My favorite part of it is the chapter on the Grand Inquisitor that I try to reread periodically. This was a fable made up by the brother Ivan, who was the intellectual, the skeptic. And the scenario was that Jesus Christ came back to earth at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. And he went around healing people. And he did not have permission. He did not have a license. He did not collect data. He did not document anything. But then one day he did something really outrageous. He went to a funeral of a beautiful young girl and raised her from the dead. Whereupon, the Grand Inquisitor immediately had him arrested and criticized him for coming back to destroy our work. You know, the work of the great utopians who decided that God had really messed up when he made the world and that Jesus Christ had really, really botched it when, when he was taken out into the desert for the three temptations of the great spirit, the devil. He had not succumbed because what we really needed was an entity that would correct the, the problems. And one of the biggest problems is that human beings were free, that freedom was insufferable for man and for human society. And they really believe that has to be wiped out. And that a conscience gets wiped out too. There's no problem with conscience. All we need to do is to feed people. And by the way, not only do you have to feed them, but they all have to believe alike. They all have to be 100% in favor of whatever you're doing. Now, Dostoevsky was writing about maybe a Russian Orthodox view of the Roman Catholic Church, 
But in fact, I think you could apply the words of the Grand Inquisitor to any of these great philosophies that come to save us. And that would include world communism. I think it would include the more modern progressives. It would include technocracy that some of you may be reading about, that we really have to get everybody to believe our way of thinking. And if they don't, well, we'll see what happens. I have to have 100% consensus. Some lessons we might learn from Las Vegas. I'm not going to talk about the details of what happened, but about one reaction by a commentator who lost her job, but probably was reflecting what a lot of people were thinking. Well, we don't feel too sorry for those folks because they were country western fans, and they were probably gun-toting Trump supporters. So it's kind of, and it shouldn't, the people are not going to suggest it's okay just to gun a lot of people down, but it really is okay if we got rid of certain segments of the population. I mean, mass slaughter is the 20th century thing. We didn't just lo lose hundreds of people at, at one, one event in the 20th century. We lost probably 100 million of them. Um, some of them were shot, 22,000 Poles shot by the Soviets. Um, some were poison gas, and the most common method was starvation. The Nazis used to herd people into an enclosure out in the open and not give them any food and water, towed out the dead bodies from time to time. Starvation works 100% of the time. And by the way, it's now being written into doctor's orders, which I think should frighten us a lot. Um, it can happen all at once, or it can happen one at a time. Solzhenitsyn was asked, how did they take, get rid of a million of you to take to the gulag? And he said, they came for us one at a time. And how have they obliterated one-fourth of the younger generation, one-fourth of your brothers and sisters or potential mates were wiped out? They were aborted one at a time. And there is pressure to make doctors, if they don't actually do abortions themselves, refer for them. Who were the heroes of the greatest villains in history? Well, Hitler's heroes included Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and the American eugenicists who felt we could make the human race better by getting rid of the unfit. Um, this is a book that of you know French philosophers I'd never heard of before. But they, if if we're doing outcomes measurement as to see how of something benefits us or whether an experiment has worked or not for society, we ought to look at some of the outcomes. Fewer abandoned children, fewer crimes, fewer lawsuits, less, less, um, fewer people in prison, more good faith in commerce, more integrity and justice. And I think if you look at these things, the United States of America following progressive policies is not doing very well at all. Um, it's, of course, I told you I'm, I'm a teacher and I, you have homework. I think you should definitely read The Law by Frederick Bastiat. It's a very short little book, The Basis for Ethical and Free at Market Economics. If you don't want to read the whole Brothers Karamazov, although I think it's really um, very intriguing, not quite as rapid a page uh, turner, but at least read the grant chapter on the Grand Inquisitor. Uh, C.S. Lewis, That Hideous Strength, Look for Tom Wolfe, the kingdom of speech. And after that, I'll take questions. Yes. Hi, my name is Gianna. Um, I had a question about uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, from what I understand, uh, Margaret Sanger, Margaret Sanger, she was a eugenist who purposefully put Planned Parenthood um, locations in uh, minority neighborhoods and because she wanted to exterminate uh, the population. And I just wanted to know your opinions on that. I think that's correct. I think she actually referred to Negroes as weeds. And they, a lot of the Planned Parenthood centers are in minority neighborhoods. And that if you're looking for health disparities, you should look at abortion because black children are aborted proportionally far more frequently than white children are. If that isn't racism or planned genocide, I'm not sure what is. Hi, my name's Savannah. Um, I'm currently a neuroscience major. Um, I've noticed in my time um, in the College of Science um, at my university that there aren't very many conservatives in the STEM field. 
And when there are conservatives, we very much feel like we can't speak out for fear of like professional repercussions. So I was wondering, because they did mention that I believe you majored in chemistry as an undergraduate, what would you say, do you have any like tips for um, kind of s letting people know your conservative beliefs like as a STEM major? That is a very good question, and I wish I had a better answer to it, because even STEM majors, I think, are in danger. Medical students have told me confidentially that they don't dare express any opinion, even if they want to be something like an orthopedic surgeon. They're afraid they can't get a residency if they're suspected of being pro-life or if they, if they have any questions whatsoever about the um, Darwin's origin of species. So if you think of something, pass it along. We maybe do what the early Christians did, drawing little fishes in the soil with our feet. Hi, I wanted to ask specifically about the issue of homosexuality, um, because I, I'm sure it's like this on most liberal campuses. There's a whole push for you know gender inclusive bathrooms, and to solve the problem, they're you know spending taxpayer dollars at our public schools to build you know separate facilities that are gender neutral. So how would you respond to that, especially considering that you know the LGBT community? does seem to feel legitimately threatened and you know they're pushing for those rights, but how do you approach that in an understanding way? And how would you even like, what are your views on you know, whether or not we should even allow gender neutral bathrooms and spend our resources on them? Well, it seems to me like a, a gender neutral bathroom is in response to pressure from a very small group of people and it just is opposed by a lot of people who would who would say so if they felt free to do so, that they, they feel embarrassed, they feel threatened, and so on, and it's being imposed on them. I think that there, there have been transgenders for a long, long time, and if they needed to use a facility, they just went into the facility of, of choice if the, man, if the man was dressed as a woman and went in there and did his business and got out. Nobody would ever, ever say anything about it. But, the question, but that's not what's happening now, that people are wanting to go into the ladies' room or at least some of them, not just to take care of nature's needs, but because they're voyeurs or because they want to uh, make a political point or because they want to harass women. And so it really, it really is a danger to our women and girls. I, I think if, if people are really passing as the other gender, then it, it's just nobody's going to bother them. But something new is happening now. How to confront that is a very good thing. But I think people eventually have to stand up for their rights and say, well, you know, we have rights. Oh. Hi, I'm Katie Gorka. I just wonder if you see anything in your profession that gives you hope, or are you really despondent about where it's going? Well, as Edward Teller once said, it is our duty to be optimists, because if you're not an optimist, you don't do anything. I, I think there are a lot of good people out of there who have common sense and who are beginning to speak out and understand what's happening. I think if you're at a meeting and you're the first person to say something, you may find that a lot of people there agree with you. It's just you have to be the one with the courage to say something first. And I think if truth is on your side, you know, truth um, and one person makes the majority. Appreciate you.